Okay, hi. Welcome to this video, which is a recording of a seminar uh, that I gave in a couple of different places um, in the lead up to starting teaching uh, this sem coming semester one. So at Dundee, we start kind of early October. Uh, so this is really things that I've been discussing, things that I've been talking about with people, reflecting on um, the online teaching that we've done so far and what we need to take from everything we know to kind of learn some lessons that we can move forward in the coming semester. So if you don't know very much about me, uh, so I'm a senior lecturer in computing at the University of Dundee. I'm interested in HCI and UX, so a lot of my teaching is to do with topics related to how we interact with computers. I also teach uh, some like introductory programming and research methods as well, so I teach a variety of different topics. And I've got some experience in researching pedagogy in particular around team working and team communication within the student body um, when they're project work, for example. So over the summer, um, I taught a variety of different settings, um, some kind of just standing in last minute, some were planned. So I taught some online students. That was my first online experience. I had a small group of students that I taught for six weeks and I had a summer school. So at Dundee we have a kind of access entry summer school, so people who don't quite make the grade can go to summer school, get some additional experience, and that qualifies them to begin with us in semester one. So I taught that as well, so that was programming. Um, and so that one was the most new, I guess, because the students who were taking that course didn't know each other, so they were all coming in blind as brand new students. The online class I taught, they already knew each other as a cohort um, and then it had moved online as a result of COVID. So two very different uh, learner communities there. So we begin 10 lessons I learned from teaching over the summer period. So this is going to be for some people, you know, teaching granny to suck eggs. Um, and I apologise and I don't. Um, I'm sorry that it is kind of maybe quite um, basic information that we should all know, but I'm not sorry because we always forget it, um, myself included. And so this is the reason the conversations I've been having recently are about these kind of topics, because, you know, we want to go back to basics and that's how we're going to get through uh, this next period of teaching. So the first one of these rules is that you shouldn't overcommit. Uh, so in computing, um, or in project management, you quite often see a diagram like this. It says that things can be good, fast and cheap, but you generally don't make something that does all three. Uh, so whenever <laughs> there's a project, the kind of joke is, we'll pick two. You know, do you want it good and fast? Uh, or do you want it cheap and fast? But it's probably not going to be very good. Uh, so if you have expectations of what your student should achieve, you know, is it all of these things? And if you have expectations of yourself, what can you achieve? So you don't want to overcommit, right? So is it really reasonable to change the delivery method, the learning outcomes, the assessment, everything at one time? Probably not. That's probably not something that we would normally do. So why have we all jumped in to do that at this point? Let's take a step back, think how much time we actually have. Can we free up time? Sure, add extra time, but time is finite. So the, therefore the amount of work that you can achieve is finite. So plan, prepare and work back. What can you actually achieve? Okay, so don't overcommit, that's the first one. The second one is that you should make your expectations explicit. And for that, I mean that you should say what you expect of students and what they expect of you. So I have in my kind of course syllabus those very headings, some things of what I expect students to do and what students can expect me to do. And these have been written over time, adjusted over time, um, and they've been generally what happens is that the graduating class or the class that have just finished that module will then help me to make adjustments for the following year. So they're constantly kind of being updated. So we can do things like add teams as well as emails and so on, but also putting them in a positive light. So 
students can expect me to give them advice on any academic or pastoral topic that they want to discuss. But, you know, I'm making it clear that it's a privilege that you would trust me to share that experience and information. So, you know, you can expect me to do what I can to help you. You can expect me to reply within a certain time. And I think it's so important that we have both of those things. Um, we don't want, I expect this of you, I expect this of you, and the student is feeling then kind of like put upon, you know, I've got massive expectations on me, but I don't know who's around me that can help. So always making it clear what students can expect from you. Um, so that's kind of in general. But if you think more clearly or carefully about what are you expecting a student to do day to day? How should a student behave in order to do well in your class. So I have something that's a bit like this, so this isn't really the final version, but each week there's a summary and there's a number of topics that we're going to cover in that week. That's just a kind of general, this is an introduction week, just broke down into different parts and some idea of what they have to do for the following week. So I'm letting them know, okay, these are the things that we're going to look into. These are the things that need to be done. And if you put yourself in your student's shoes, you know, you log on to the VLE and you look at what's available. Could a student or any other person with no knowledge of this module figure out what is going on? Um, and this is a risk management as much as anything else, right? If you are run over by a bus, can someone come in and figure out what to do? We've all been in situations where someone's been ill or someone's had to step in last minute and you're running around trying to figure out what's going on. So the more information clearly you can put forward, the better it is for students and potentially colleagues that have to come in and help you. And that concept of making things clear and giving good explanation, that isn't an educator skill set, right? That's something that we do in classes every day, explain things. There are a series of steps and you would get to this potential outcome. There are various options and you would pick one because. So all of these things we teach. So why are we not representing it so clearly in our own modules? Why are we relying on students to ask us the question? Think how much time you can save if those questions don't have to be asked. Okay, number three, use technology intentionally. So, so many conversations I have had uh, <laughs> this summer um, about creating videos is, you know, right, I have this technology, what can I do with it? No, absolutely not. Start with your idea. Sketch out your idea. What do you want to achieve? Is this a simple video or is it something more complicated? Is this something that you would previously teach using a whiteboard to the class, okay. All I need is some kind of blank area where I can express myself. Do you want to include lots of different parts and put them together? Then you probably need something that's a bit more complex. So there are two ends of the spectrum, really, as far as I see it. You have something like, you know, you've got Camtasia, OBS, iMovie, whatever it is you're using, and you're creating polished, refined videos. But let me point you back to lesson one. Don't overcommit. Students don't didn't come to see Netflix movies. <laughs> Students came to get information and to get information from you in a way that makes sense to them. So if it's a case that actually a bit of paper and a pen is what you need, then start with that. Start simple and build up. Don't be driven by the technology because when things are driven by technology, they don't work. That's why technology projects fail. People don't stop and think, why am I doing this? Who is going to be using it? And if you can answer both those questions, you'll get to the best use of technology. That's not to say you don't use technology, but you use technology in the best way possible. If you start with technology, what you end up doing is what everyone else has done, because that's what you see around you. And it's probably, in fact, it's definitely, in most cases, not the correct way to be doing things. So think carefully about what you want to achieve and then drive the technology from there. Okay, number four is about 
external resources. So external resources are powerful, they're useful, they're available. Um, don't waste time reinventing the wheel. Um, why would you when there's so many resources out there? So this is an example of kind of what I've had students looking at for one week of my class. So I've got talks at Google. That's an introductory level thing, right? Talks at Google are seminars, podcasts, uh, video recordings, but they're talks that people who work at Google can go along and get an idea about something new. So they're entry level. Why would I recreate that if, so that guy there is Jake Knapp and he's the person who designed a sprint methodology, a design methodology. Why would I then go and explain his design methodology if he can do it for me, right? Straight from the horse's mouth, it means more there's trust from the students that, okay, this is the guy. This is the guy who did it. I'm going to listen to him. What I have is I have a whole bunch of external resources and then I have me bringing it all together. I'm putting all of these things into context. I'm putting all of these things in the context of the module we are studying within an industrial context, within kind of linking it to other modules that students are doing. I'm just giving them an overall summary. Um, and so they're still hearing from me, they're hearing my point of view, they're hearing my kind of method of things, um, but they're not having to listen to me the full time. I wouldn't want to listen to me the full time. Uh, so the more you can use external resources, the more you have time to free up that you can use to create things that are more meaningful. So by that, I'm thinking of things like assessment. Rather than record an hour's introduction to calculus, those exist out there. Many, many people have made introduction to calculus videos. Rather than spend your time doing that, why not spend your time looking at new assessment methods or tidying up what you already have in terms of assessment? Have you got a rubric? Have you got it all laid out for students in a really understandable way? No? Then that's probably a better use of your time than recording a video of some basic information. So don't be reinventing the wheel. Use your time wisely. Uh, the fifth is that uh, personal feedback works. <laughs> okay, so when we give feedback to students, we want to give feedback to students based on what they have done. Sure, there's like a generic, in general, this was well done, this could be improved. But when we give things like we identify a particular area of strength for a student, that gives that student confidence. And that gives that student confidence that they've done the right thing, that they know, that they're capable. And so they'll go on and achieve more. I like to give feedback to students in a variety of ways. Um, I like to always make sure I speak the feedback. Um, and whether that is recording some audio for the student, recording a video for the student, looking at their own uh, work. Um, I may also deliver it in class as a kind of general thing, because what happens is students hear the general stuff and it becomes catastrophic. You know, I didn't do that. Oh, that's it. I'm, I'm failing. Uh, whereas if you can give general feedback and then say, in your case, this was good and this needs improved, that's going to help the student. Um, now, we do this all the time for, I'm thinking, like, in a computing lab situation. The student might contact me and say, oh, hey, I've got this error and I can't figure out what to do. Rather than me going Google in the error and sending them a document for them to read online, someone else online had this problem, go and look here. I'll record me doing that. I'll just press record on a screen recorder and I'll say, right, OK, I've put the error into Google. This is what I found. This is what that means. And crucially, this is how it applies to what you've got. So the feedback is how to fix your problem. Uh, so feedback is the area everyone falls down on. <laughs> NSS, um, you know, league tables, whatever, it always comes back uh, to feedback. So that time that you're not spent creating that introduction to calculus, use it to think about how you're going to spend feedback. Make sure that you have time, you have committed time to providing that feedback. 
Okay, we're halfway there. Oh yeah, we're not. Uh, so the feedback, if you're giving feedback to everyone, always ask for feedback. Um, so the university will ask for feedback on your behalf, but the best feedback I ever get from students is casual conversation. You know, how's it going? What would you improve about this? That lab sheet, does it make sense to you? Um, so with the online students at the start of summer, I just emailed them afterwards and said, look, it's the first time I've ever taught anything online. Um, please give me some feedback. Let me know what worked. Let me know what didn't. Um, and I did that kind of halfway through and then I did it at the end. Uh, so a lot of what I got back was really positive, but there were some small things that could help. Um, so things like my positioning of the cameras. So you see like my cameras in the top left hand corner. So initially I didn't leave a space in my slides and some information was getting hidden. So I've kind of shrunk my face to, to give more to the slides, that sort of stuff. So for me, because I ask for feedback, I'm more confident in what it is that I'm trying to achieve. The fact that I'm recording a video, I can do that now much more easily than before because I've got that nice positive feedback to say it's working, keep going, rather than just negative stuff. Okay, now we're halfway. Some students, or many students, will not do the pre-work. Now, when we're relying on this active learning environment and we have students who will not do stuff, if many students don't do something, that is my fault. If many students don't do it, it's because they can't figure out what it is they have to do or how they have to do it or the task I've given them is just too big for them to start. Um, so if some students don't do it, you know, you've got a handful of students, fine. You're always going to have that group for many different reasons. But when it becomes many students, I've got to look inside and decide, okay, is that my fault? And this goes back to the previous kind of lesson about make your expectations explicit. Do students know what to do? Have you modelled at some point breaking that down into manageable chunks for them? If you haven't, it's time to start because the way that you model that is the way that they will learn it. Uh, so yeah, don't be afraid to say, look, do you know what? It's my fault uh, because mistakes are learning opportunities, right? And so that's both for students and for us. So own those mistakes. If I think of, for, so I teach programming and a lot of that time I'll record like kind of me doing some live coding so that students can refer back to it. And I've done this for, for a long time, but I make mistakes, right? So I will make the mistake, run it, get an error and then, oh, got an error. And I'll just talk out loud. Well, I think maybe it could be about this section and I've seen it before. It was about blah. So by showing that I make mistakes, I'm modeling not only how to fix mistakes, but I'm also normalizing failure. Um, when you program, especially when you're learning to program, failure is huge. And how you recover from that failure says a lot. There's always a group of students in a class who will just give up at the first sight of a problem. And there are always students who will, you know, determined to solve the problem and spend way longer on it than is really necessary. You know, if they'd gone and got coffee and come back, the problem would have been solved. Uh, so somewhere in the middle, you want to create that kind of environment. So I have made videos where I've said, look, I don't know the answer. I'll make a new video tomorrow. If anyone sees this and they know the answer, please let me know. What that allows is me to then give that student credit in the next video and say, right, well, you know, Joe found the answer. Here is the solution. And these are quick videos that I can record because I'm probably doing it anyway to make sure that, you know, everything's working, etc. So by normalizing that failure, what I'm showing is that students can also fail and recover. Um, so I, I'll never forget, so a student came to me and said, so I'm not going to name the colleague, but they said, we'll call the colleague, I don't know, Joe. 
uh, Joe blogs. Uh, so the student came and they said, oh, Rachel, I, I don't think I'm very good at programming. Programming's not for me. Oh, really? Why? What's going on? Well, I'm going to Joe's class and everything he does, he just knows it. And I'm running around scrabbling, fixing errors, looking at my notes. I've never got to the point where I can just sit down and do it. When will I be as good a programmer as Joe? And I had to explain to the student, Joe Googles too. You just don't see it. Um, and this was like, you know, like a massive turning point in terms of understanding the concept of programming and the journey you take to learn it. So normalize mistakes, own them, forget the specifics, but remember what you learned and teach students how to remember what they learned. Um, number eight, we are so close to the end. Uh, number eight is building a community. So students learn from one another often unconsciously, so it's up to us to set an environment where this can happen. Now, the very fact that students would sit in a lecture hall, there's a community because they're one of a group and they can kind of have a look and see, yep, other people are writing this down, other people are a bit, mm, there's question marks there, I've got questions too. You know, that very sense of just being in one place and we can create being in one place in many ways whether it's discussion groups, whether it's creating a document that students can comment on, or whether there's a series of quick tasks that students can do. So one thing I did with the summer school, which worked fabulously, was um, so they had already had a couple of weeks before I got them and there just wasn't really like a kind of coming together and helping each other that I was hoping would be there. So. What I had them do was record a short video, just a, like 30 seconds, one minute. Tell me who you are, tell me what degree you're coming to study and give me a TV recommendation. And I just want to learn a bit about who you are so that I can help you do well in this class. And the response was really good. So what I discovered afterwards was that students were speaking to each other to do group work. They started off on a chat on Teams and then they did audio calls, but they had never done videos. And a student said to me, the fact that I had to record that video, it put me outside my comfort zone, but it was really useful because the next time I had a group conversation, I just turned my video on. And a few other people did it. And then the next time we all did it. And suddenly I felt like I was so much more part of that group than just, you know, I was talking to names. I didn't know who anyone was. I didn't have a sense of personalities because we didn't really have that kind of strong communication. So small tasks are enough to get students talking. Uh, the other task that I use often is Mr. Men books. Um, so I have, all, these are almost like kind of icebreaker. I use them for leadership. Um, activities. So basically I've got a bunch of Mr. Men books and I've cut the spine off so they're now just all loose pages and I put two or three books together in a poly pocket, give it to the team and ask them to build the books. Um, so there's usually a nostalgia to start with. Oh my goodness, Mr. Men books, it's so long since I've had Mr. Men books. There'll be someone who's never had Mr. Men books, has no idea what's going on so they have to explain it to them. Um, you can do things like pull one student aside and be like, I want you just to, to not really engage. I want you to be a bit of an awkward team member and see what happens. And it's great because you see them learn to grapple with this. Oh, this person's not engaged. As a team, we should engage them. So they start to learn these team working skills through just scenarios that you've put in front of them. So there's a lot of other icebreakers out there. There are a lot of... Um, different activities that you can have students do just to start that communication between them. Uh, number nine is to be human. Um, we're all human at the end of the day. I'm a human being, I've got a personality, I've got hobbies, I've got interests, and it makes me approachable. Students can find some common ground to discuss with me, they can have a laugh, have a joke, 
um, and they can get the information they want. I don't want to be, you know, stuck behind a barrier. I don't want to be like this, oh, well, I can't speak to Rachel because she's far too busy, right? I want them to know they can come and speak to me. Um, so, you know, I don't bite. <laughs> I'm just a person. Come chat to me. And I'm not saying that I have to share my whole personal life with my students. And there are many, many things that I don't share um, in my professional life, but which I think we all have. And so, there, but I can give a snippet. I can give some, inf I can say I watch this on the TV. Um, one thing I do sometimes is I play music at the start of my classes. It's usually a song I can't get out of my head. Uh, so I'll just kind of like be playing that music. And then it starts a conversation um, about what's going on. When did I hear this track, etc. So just be human. Let Open the door a little bit. Let students in. And if all else fails, duck it. Um, this is not intended to be humorous in any way. I actually do mean a duck. Uh, so this is my duck. You may have your own duck. And all you need to do is chat to the duck and tell the duck your problems. So this comes from a concept in computer programming called rubber duck debugging. And the idea is if you have a problem, you want to speak to people explain the problem and the act of explaining the problem improves your understanding right we know this um so in computing it's called rubber duck debugging so it's not uncommon to see people with like little ducks um all over the place the dundee university computing society is called ducks their mascot is a duck um so talk it through with a colleague a friend um and if all else fails just duck it it's great okay so I shall sit my duck back down. This is my duck. Uh, okay, so one thing that perhaps has not been clear through what I've done, spoken about so far, is whether this is in relation to online or whether it's in relation to uh, in-person teaching. Uh, and that's because I think that the lessons that we learn apply to both of these situations and really my my take-home message is that it's only teaching and that's intended in a positive sense right we can teach we know we can teach so if we go back to what are the basics of teaching then this coming semester is going to be easy because we have all the skills to build a community we have all the skills to explain things we have all the skills to communicate we just need to do it in a different context. Um, so it's only teaching and we can do it. Uh, so that's really my message. That's what I hope you take away. Um, and I hope that this kind of, uh, kind of suck eggs basic introduction to some, you know, overarching concepts of teaching that are completely subject, subject independent um, will give you just a little bit of confidence when you're going out that you can do it. Thank you.